Let's learn about a very useful framework for making statistical tests called likelihood ratio tests. So you are lost, and you don't know if you are in Italy or China. You are pretty sure you're in Italy, so you're going to believe that until you find evidence otherwise. You don't have GPS, and you can only think of one way to gain more information. You decide to ask the first person you see if they like pasta. Now, 90% of people in Italy like pasta, but only 50% of people in China like pasta. If they like pasta, we'll keep believing we are in Italy. And if they don't like pasta, we'll now believe that we are in China. Our null hypothesis is that we are in Italy. That's our default assumption. And our alternative hypothesis is that we are in China. And we're only going to believe that if the person we see does not like pasta. And we will believe the null hypothesis until we get evidence otherwise. So we ask one person, and we tentatively believe we are in Italy. But this person says, no, I hate pasta. And that makes us doubt that we are in Italy and now believe that we are in China. Since they answered no, let's compare the likelihood of saying no in each country. Saying no, I don't like pasta was more likely in China. It was not only more likely, but it was much more likely. The ratio of the probability of not liking pasta in Italy over the probability of not liking pasta in China is 0.1 over 0.5, or 1 over 5, 0.2. Someone is only one-fifth as likely to not like pasta in Italy compared to China. This is a likelihood ratio. It's a ratio of two likelihoods. And we are going to prefer this form, where the null hypothesis likelihood is in the numerator of the fraction. But we could also talk about it the other way. Equivalently, someone is five times more likely to not like pasta in China. We just switch the probabilities on top and bottom. That is still a likelihood ratio. But what if they liked pasta? So this person says, yes, I love pasta. So we still believe we're in Italy. Since they answered yes, let's compare the likelihood of saying yes in each country. It was quite a bit more likely to say, yes, I like pasta in Italy. The probability of liking pasta in Italy was 0.9, and the probability of liking pasta in China was 0.5. So 0.9 over 0.5 is our likelihood ratio, which is 1.8. Someone is 1.8 times more likely to like pasta in Italy compared to China. Equivalently, someone is only 1 over 1.8, or 0.555 times as likely to like pasta in China compared to Italy. These mean the same thing. So again, our null hypothesis is that we are in Italy, and we collect some data. The person says, no, I don't like pasta, and we reject the null hypothesis when the person doesn't like pasta. Now, data is more often numerical, so we might also see this represented numerically. A statistic that says zero people out of the one that we asked like pasta. So we reject the null hypothesis when the number of people who likes pasta is zero. This is basing a decision on a statistic. But we're also going to base decisions on likelihood ratios. We said that the likelihood ratio was 0.2. So equivalent to the statistic and equivalent to them telling you they don't like pasta is the likelihood ratio we get in the scenario where they say they don't like pasta. And that likelihood ratio is 0.2. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis when this likelihood ratio is 0.2. Now, if they said, yes, I do like pasta, that's going to cause us to fail to reject the null hypothesis and still believe that we're in Italy. Equivalently, we could express this as a statistic. One person in our sample of one liked pasta, and that's going to cause us to fail to reject the null hypothesis. Equivalently, we could compute another statistic, the likelihood ratio. And the likelihood ratio, when the person liked pasta, was 1.8. So we could say that we failed to reject the null hypothesis when the likelihood ratio is 1.8. So we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the likelihood ratio is 1.8, and that's because we fail to reject the null hypothesis when the observed outcome is more likely in Italy than in China. Our default is that we believe we're in Italy. So when Italy is more likely, we're obviously going to still believe it. On the other hand, when the likelihood ratio is 0.2, that means the observed outcome was less likely in Italy, and it was more likely in China. So 0.2 is going to cause us to reject this null hypothesis that we're in Italy because it's less likely than China. But what's our cutoff for rejecting? Do we always reject the null hypothesis when our likelihood ratio, which will denote lambda, is less than one? Maybe that's not the best cutoff. Should we reject the null when lambda is less than 1.5? Well, that's between these two numbers, so that should work. 
Should we reject the null hypothesis when lambda is less than 0.3? Well, that would work as well. Any number between 0.2 and 1.8 could be considered the cutoff for what is too low and will make us reject the null hypothesis. Okay, but how do we choose the cutoff in general? We sort of made an ad hoc rule for rejecting the null hypothesis here based on one person, but usually we're going to collect a lot of data. And in statistics, we usually want to choose the cutoff, which we call a critical value, in a way that controls the type 1 error rate. So the type 1 error rate is alpha, which is often 0.05, and that's the probability we reject the null hypothesis when the null hypothesis is true. So what was our type 1 error rate alpha in this scenario? So alpha is the probability we reject the null when the null is true, and rejecting the null means that we conclude that we're in China. And the null being true means we are in Italy. So what's the probability that we conclude we are in China when we're really in Italy? And that was really just this probability that the person said they don't like pasta, which would change our mind. And that's point one. But in statistics, we're not going to make a rule and then find our type 1 error rate. We're going to set the type 1 error rate and find the rule. So we're going to set alpha equal to 0.05 in advance, and then we're going to choose the cutoff that guarantees that type 1 error rate. So let's look at an example of this. Let's say our null hypothesis is that the drug works 10% of the time. Theta equals 0.1. This is the probability the drug works. And then alternative hypothesis is that the drug works half the time, that theta is 0.5. And we give the drug to 100 people. Now, if 0 to 10 people get better, that's going to be consistent with the null hypothesis. So we would clearly fail to reject the null hypothesis. And similarly, if all the people got better, that's clearly going to be a case where the null hypothesis is false and we would reject it. But where should we draw the line and decide to reject? Should it be 15, 20, 30, 50? It's not exactly clear. But what we're going to do is we're going to set the type 1 error rate and find out. So let's figure out the cutoff point that guarantees we will only reject the null 5% of the time when it's really true. And we'll start with the likelihood ratio. We're going to do a likelihood ratio test, but what we're going to find out is that the likelihood ratio will actually reveal the test statistic. It will give us a cutoff in terms of the number of people. Okay, so our likelihood ratio, lambda, is the ratio of two likelihoods. Okay, so it's the probability that we're going to get a certain number k successes under the null hypothesis that the drug works 10% of the time over the probability that we get that number of successes when theta equals 0.5. So this is our likelihood ratio. So the number of successes in 100 trials is going to follow a binomial distribution. So here we got the PMF, the probability mass function for a binomial distribution, when theta equals 0.1 and when theta equals 0.5. So here's our likelihood ratio, and we can do a lot of simplifying here, right? We can cancel this entire part out with the uh, combinations, and then we can combine the exponents here uh, in a creative way. So uh, 0.1 over 0.5 is just 0.2, right? So that's where we had the 0.2 uh, to the K. And 0.9 uh, over 0.5 is 1.8. So these are the same numbers we saw in the China and Italy example uh, just for the drug now. Okay, so we have 0.2 to the K over 1.8 to the 100 minus K. So that is our likelihood ratio. And we're going to reject the null hypothesis when the likelihood ratio is low which makes us think that our null hypothesis is less likely. But the question is, how low does it have to be? So this cutoff, C, is going to be some number, probably less than 1, uh, that is going to cause us to reject the null hypothesis. So lambda was 0.2 to the k, 1.8 to the 100 minus k. So we just replace our lambda with that because that's its definition. And what we want to do is we want to simplify this and get it in terms of k because k is the number of people who got better, and that's what we want to find out. How do we get that k out? Well, let's take the logarithms of each side. So let's take the log of each side. And now we didn't change anything, um, but we have a new constant c over here, log of c. So we're just going to rename that, and we're going to call it c prime. Now, it doesn't really matter because at the end of the day, we're, we're going to cycle through a bunch of different cutoffs here, and we only really care about the one uh, that we get at the end here. So we could just call this C if we wanted to, but I just want to clarify it's not the same C as the original C. Okay, now we want to simplify this. So we're going to use uh, properties of logarithms to get these Ks out in front. Okay, so we simplified that just by using properties of logarithms to bring the Ks out in front. And now I want to get the Ks by themselves. So I'm going to rearrange this a little bit and we factored out the k. So I have k times a number plus 100 times a number is less than c prime. Okay, so I want to 
get rid of that number, I'm gonna subtract it from both sides, and now I get a new constant, C double prime, and I'm left with this over here. And again, I wanna get this K by itself. So this number here, log 0.2 minus log 0.8 is a negative number. So when I divide through by this number, it's actually going to flip this inequality. So I'm gonna divide by this number, and then we're gonna get that we reject the null hypothesis when K is greater than some constant, C triple prime. Now, again, it doesn't really matter. We don't have to keep track of all the Cs. What we care about is this final equation. We're gonna reject the null when the number of successes K is greater than some number. So we'll reject the null hypothesis when the number of people who, K who improve is greater than a cutoff C. And we would hope this is our criterion, right? We thought the drug was gonna work 10% of the time. We wanna prove that it's better so we're gonna reject when we see enough people get better, more than C people. And we started this problem off by phrasing it in terms of the likelihood ratio, uh, the, the ratio of these probabilities, but we simplified and it revealed to us that the statistic K was what we would base our decision on. And the question is, how do we find C? So we want the probability that we reject the null when the null is true to be 0.5. While rejecting the null, we do that when K is greater than C. So we want to know what is the probability that k is greater than c when h0 is true. And h0 being true means that theta is 0.1. We want the probability that k is greater than c when theta equals 0.1 to be 0.05. And this is just another way of saying, what is the 95th percentile of k, right? Because we only want it to be greater than c 5% of the time. And that's the definition of the 95th percentile. So c... This cutoff can be found using software uh, like R, so you might use the Q binome function. This is the inverse CDF or the quantile function. And what we find is that we'll reject the null hypothesis when we observe more than 15 people improve. 15 people is enough to make me doubt the null hypothesis and reject it. Now, why are likelihood ratio tests so good? Uh, we have something called the Neyman Pearson lemma. And when we are testing two simple hypotheses, which is what we've seen so far, where we have theta is equal to some number theta zero versus a simple alternative, one number, right? Theta equals 0.5. Um, when we have simple hypotheses like this, then the likelihood ratio test that rejects when our likelihood ratio is less than C, the type of likelihood ratio test we've been doing, this is the most powerful of all tests with significance level alpha. So that means that out of all level alpha tests that have type one error rate, 0.05, the likelihood ratio test is going to have the highest power of all those tests. It's gonna have the greatest ability to reject the null hypothesis when we should, when the alternative is true. In other words, likelihood ratio tests are often the optimal test. And you might say, okay, but I've literally never seen a test of simple hypotheses. I've never seen an alternative hypothesis where theta is equal to some number. Usually what we see in an intro stats class is that theta is more than some number, or theta is less than some number, or maybe theta is not equal to some number, a two-sided test. But when we have these one-sided alternatives like these, these composite hypotheses, the LRT, the likelihood ratio test, is still usually the most powerful test. And this is a result called the carlin rubin theorem. And this is just an extension of the Neyman-Pearson lemma. So whenever our probability densities, our models, have a nice property known as the monotone likelihood ratio property, which a lot of common distributions have, then these likelihood ratio tests are still the most powerful, even for the one-directional composite hypotheses. Let's do one more quick problem for practice. Let's suppose that human heights follow a normal distribution with a known standard deviation sigma. And we want to test our null hypothesis that the average height is 66 inches versus the alternative that the average height is 70 inches. And we're going to measure n people. So we have our likelihood ratio, the likelihood of the null over the likelihood of the alternative. And each of these is just going to be a product of the normal density function. Okay, the normal density function with mean 66 and the normal density function with mean 70. And we're going to reject the null hypothesis when this likelihood ratio lambda is less than some number C. So we're going to reject when this likelihood ratio is less than C. And now what we want to do is we want to simplify this. And instead of having it be in terms of the likelihood ratio, we want to get something in terms of the data, in terms of the x's. So let's see if we can do that. So a lot of stuff here is going to cancel, okay? So all of these 
constants out in front are going to completely cancel with each other. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to comp combine these exponents. So we can just turn this into one exponent, the exponent of the sum of these minus the sum of all of these. So we do that simplification, and this is what we end up with, and we're going to reject the null when this is less than c. So I want to get rid of that exponential so that I can get to these x's that I want. So I'm just going to take the log of both sides. Okay, so I take the log of both sides, and now this is really the log of the original c, but we're not really keeping track of that. This is just some constant that we will find at the end. Okay, so I took the log of both sides. Now I want to get rid of this constant out in front. Now this constant is a negative number, so when I divide through by it, I'm going to flip the sign. Okay, so I got rid of it and I flipped the inequality, so now it's greater than. So now it's greater than, and now I'm going to expand out these squares. So I'm going to expand out these squares by uh, foiling this out. And uh, this is what we get when we expand that. And what's going to happen here? The xi squareds are going to cancel with each other. So these are going to cancel. And now I'm left with this. And now these are just constants. It's a bunch of sums of 66 squareds and a bunch of sums of 70 squareds. So I'm going to subtract those away from both sides. And that's going to change this constant. Uh, but again, we don't really care about that. So I'm just going to get rid of those numbers. Uh, and we're getting very, very close here. Uh, so I want to get rid of these twos, so I'm going to divide through by the twos and get rid of them. And now I'm just left with some x's on the inside, so I'm going to uh, do this. Minus 66 minus negative 70, that's going to be 4xi. Okay, so now I have the sum of the 4xi's greater than c. I want to get rid of the 4, so I'm going to divide by 4. So we're going to reject the null when the sum of the xi's is more than c. This is going to be our rejection rule. Now, I'm going to do a little trick here to make it more natural for us, and I'm actually gonna divide each side by n. Okay, so we're gonna actually divide both sides by n, and what we see then is we're gonna reject the null when x bar, our sample average, is more than some number, which is the same thing as saying the sum, but this is maybe a more natural. We're going to conclude, right, we're gonna conclude that people are taller than 66 inches when our average height is higher than some cutoff, which makes sense. And we started with the idea of testing whether the likelihood ratio was very low, but after simplifying, it revealed that we are really just basing our decision on a statistic, the sample mean, x bar. And that cutoff C is going to be determined by our type one error rate alpha. So if we see a picture here, this is the null distribution of x bar uh, under the null hypothesis, right? That the average is 66. We're gonna reject when we're greater than some cutoff and we only want to incorrectly reject 5% of the time. So what is this number here? Well, this is just 66, and whatever number is 1.645 standard deviations above 66. Okay, so we could find this number using software, or this is just using properties of normal distributions and z-scores to find this critical value. And this is the most powerful test we could ever come up with, with alpha equals 0.05. And normal distributions have the monotone likelihood ratio property, so the one-sided test that we might be more familiar with would also be the most powerful test uh, that we could ever come up with, with alpha equals 0.05. And that's why we learn this type of z-test when we take a statistics course, because it's the most powerful test. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe to learn more statistics.